Now I'd like to welcome Jim Berry, president of the Berry Company, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Acting President Leslie. Um, it is my privilege to uh, introduce our speaker today, Charles Franklin. Uh, professor Franklin has asked that we keep it short, so I will. Uh, Charles Franklin is a professor of law and public policy at Marquette Law School, where he directs the Marquette Law School poll. Since the inception of the Marquette Law School poll in 2012, Professor Franklin has conducted over 74 polls of Wisconsin, <clears throat> providing insight into the dynamics of elections, evaluations of public figures, and issues facing the state and nation, as well as the electoral horse race. Since 2019, he has also directed the MU Law National Polling concerning the U.S. Supreme Court and a variety of other national issues. Professor Franklin was a professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin Madison for 22 years before leaving to join the Marquette Law School in 2012. He is past president of the Society for Political Methodology and an elected fellow of the Society. From 2002 to 2020, he was a member of the ABC News Election Night Decision Desk. He holds a PhD in political science from the University of Michigan. Let's give a warm rotary welcome to Professor Charles Franklin. Thank you. You're a polite audience. That last line about where my degree is from got me booed in Madison one day. Uh, but it was all in good spirits and good fun, of course. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, we'll see after the talk whether you still think, think it was a good use of your time. Um, my invitation asked me to talk about polling and what was a postmortem about polling. So while we will talk about the fall campaigns at the end, I do want to spend the time, and I think it's useful at least from my perspective, to talk a little bit more about polling in more detail than what you get from news coverage and certainly from what you get from Twitter coverage. Because I think there's a real limit on how much people understand what the issues are and too much of a tendency to on the one hand say polling is broken and so on, but at the same time saying polling's broken, to expect such exquisite precision from polling that if the polls are off by two or three points, then they must be broken. You know, they're completely wrong. Uh, just this morning as I was driving over, I was listening to a podcast with a National White House correspondent. And he said in the podcast, well, the one thing we know for sure is the polls will be wrong on election day. So I, of course, wanted to reach through the podcast and strangle him. Um, but on the other hand, it's equally insane to say that the polls will be spot on in each, each election. And so much of my talk today is to try to explain to you in more depth than you usually get about what the strengths and the weaknesses of polling are and what we can expect. And in the process, take a look at how well and poorly the polls did in 2022 around the country and here in Wisconsin. So that's really my agenda today. Um, I guess I should go forward and show you the topics of the day. So I've just said all of these things. It's not easy, and I hope by the end you'll appreciate both what our successes and our struggles are with polling in the modern world, how accurate we were in 2022, or the flip side of accuracy, the errors of 2022. Uh, I'm told by the media consultants I should say accuracy, not error, but to hell with that. Y'all are smart. You're not going to be fooled by that. Um, and I want to talk about the sources of error in polls because, again, we know a lot about those things, even if we don't know how to fix them perfectly. So I want to take you through some of that. And then, as promised, so you don't all just walk out now, um, we will take a look at the end at this year's elections here. Uh, let's 
cut to the chase, Evers and Johnson won. I, I hope that's not news to anybody. Um, I want to start by talking about sampling because random sampling, as it's colloquially known, or probability sampling, as people in my tribe talk about it sort of as a specialty, is at the root of why we think polls should work in the first place. Imagine you have a city of 500,000 people and you'd like to do a poll of 500 people. Why would you want to talk to 500 instead of 500,000? Because it's a thousand times less expensive to talk to 500 than to talk to 500,000. It's not feasible to do a complete census. That's why we only do them 10 year, every 10 years in this country, and it's enormously expensive then. So you'd like to do a sample, but how do I get the 500 people I talk to? I could go stand around outside the end of a Bucks game and interview 500 people there, or I could disperse to church parking lots on Sunday mornings and talk to 500 people there. I'd certainly have no trouble finding 500 people that want to talk at bars in the evening. But how would I know any of those three samples are in any way representative of the city? And the answer is you would have no way to know that because you're just talking to people where it's convenient to talk to them. The theory of probability or random sampling is we should know the probability that every one of those 500,000 people was selected into the sample. And usually we want everybody to have an equal chance of selection. So therefore, if you imagined a list of 500,000 people, we want every person on that list to have one in a thousand chance to be in the sample. And all kinds of magic flows from that. Because if everybody has an equal chance, my sample will have about the right percentage of men and women, white and black, rich and poor. Just simply because everybody had an equal chance. Now, Random sampling means we are only talking about 500 people. So we won't get exactly the same thing we would get if we interviewed all 500,000. But we've done something that makes sure that everybody has the same chance to be represented in the survey. And therefore, I don't have to know ahead of time how many white and black, how many rich and poor, how many college graduates and non-graduates I need, because the sample itself will tell me all those things. So that's the random sampling part of surveys. And it, in almost every way, is the easy part. The technology for drawing a random sample is extremely well developed. The statistical theory behind it is voluminous and rock solid. So sampling is absolutely the strong part of all surveys, all polls. So having said that, let's look at how the polls did in 2022. This is the distribution of the errors in the polls for governor in all of the governor's races across the country last year. Uh, so the purple bars are the uh, individual polls in individual states. That vertical black line is zero error. To the right is uh, the poll was too Republican. To the left, the poll was too Democratic. Obviously, we'd really like for every poll to be right on that zero line. But of course, there's a spread around those things. And some of that spread is due to random sampling. Just, you didn't interview everybody. But some of it, arguably most of it, is due to other kinds of sources of error that we'll get to in a minute. So on average, how did the polls do last year? Not bad. The red line is the average error, which is minus 0.38 percentage points to Democratic. Slightly too democratic, but awfully close to, on average, getting the races on. The problem, of course, is they're spread around that. Not everything is inside that um, or right at zero or close to it. 
Most of the polls, about half of them actually, are within four points of the actual outcome. And more than that are within eight points of the actual outcome. But there are a few that are further away from that. This black bell-shaped curve is the distribution of errors we should expect if only sampling error was at work. Only the fact that we're interviewing 800 or 1,000 people in each of these states, if that was the only thing that was causing error, then the distribution of the purple bars ought to fall within that bell-shaped curve. So what do you see? First, you see there's a lot of white space in the middle above the purple bar and below the curve. What that means is we're not getting as many polls that are real close to zero as random sampling alone would lead us to expect. The second is if you look out at the tails, there are purple bars that extend above the bell-shaped curve, which again is saying the same thing but at the ends, that we're getting more polls that are further away from zero than pure random sampling would lead you to expect. How many? Well, 48.9% uh, of the polls were within four points. If it were only sampling error, we would expect that to be more like 68% within four points of the outcome. So we're doing a bit worse in not having as many polls close to zero as we'd like. Within eight points, we're seeing 64% of the polls within uh, eight points. We'd think that it's a random sampling alone, that'd be 95%. So we are definitely, sorry, I said 64, 85% are within eight points. We'd expect 95%. So there's definitely more spread in the errors than sampling alone can explain. That's not really a surprise. Let's look at the errors here in Wisconsin. These are, and, and the previous one as well, are looking at polls done in the last three weeks of the election. So pretty close to election day, but not just the last week or so, because there's simply not enough there. And what you see is that, first of all, in the governor's race, the average poll was off by 3.4 points. Too favorable to Michaels, the Republican, not favorable enough to Evers, the Democrat. Nobody erred by overstating the Democratic lead. You can see that there were three polls that were pretty close to zero. Uh, I did highlight mine, the blue dot, the Marquette poll. We're average on the governor's race. We're not better, we're not worse than the average this year, being off by three. Our final poll had the race tied, and of course, Evers won by 3.4 percentage points. And then there are several that are quite a ways off, including Trafalgar, Data for Progress. That's interesting because Trafalgar leans to the right and Data for Progress leans to the left, and yet they both had about the equal pro-Republican bias in their results. And finally, Emerson College at the top, which does a ton of polling, but did not have a good year here. Um, on the Senate race, the average error is a bit less, 1.9 points to Republican. Here, there was one poll with a big Democratic advantage off to the left, two that nailed the race, which was a one-point race, and they had one-point leads. Our poll and one other had it at a two-point race, so we were off by a point. And then again, you see the polls off to the right, which are mostly the same polls that were off in the Senate race, but not all the same. So there's some difference. Even uh, Trafalgar was above average in its error on the governor's race, but slightly below average on the Senate race, for example. So it's not necessarily that the pollster will be off by as much in two races that they poll at the same time with the same respondents. Um, you can look individually about accuracy, but you can also look, I mean, race by race, but you can also look over time. So this is the Marquette scoreboard or track record since we started the poll in 2012. Um, you can see that most of the polls are inside that yellow region, which is inside the margin of error for the poll. But there are three that are outside that. 
Two of them are just a little outside, the 16 Senate race and the 2020 presidential race. And one is just god awful. That's the 2016 presidential race where we were off by uh, nearly seven points. So we've had one really bad result and one that happened at a time when we had plenty of good company, but I'd rather not have the company. Um, mostly we've done quite well. On, a, on average, we're a half a point too democratic, which is pretty small. And if you take the absolute value of the error, we are, are off by an average of 2.2 percentage points on all the races that we've covered. Uh, and that happens to be our error this year as well. We were, for us, exactly average this year. Um, one point off in the Senate race, 3.4 off in the governor's race. So the average 2.2, the same error that we've had long term. Um, I wish it were better, but there it is. The other way to look at pollsters is to compare a bunch of pollsters over time on all of the polling they do. Uh, the website 538.com does this and rates all the pollsters that have been active. Here are those ratings. We are ranked seventh of 492 pollsters nationwide. Um, you know, I detest those above me and I glory in the defeat of those below. But more realistically, the fact is that, um, you know, I'm certainly not going to turn down number seven. Um, and we'll get this updated next in the next few months, and we'll see whether we do better or worse. Given that we had an average performance, I don't expect this to change very much. But the, but the serious point, and there are lots of complaints about 538 these days, but they are the only group out there that is doing a genuinely serious effort to look at everybody's polls over every election they've done and to produce these, these ratings. So uh, setting aside where anybody lands, I'm often asked, how do I know which truck pollsters to trust? And the short answer is the Ronald Reagan line, trust but verify. <laughs> Don't just blindly pick one pollster and assume they're always right. Up near the top of this, the second rated pollster is ABC News and the Washington Post. But in 28, 2020, they had Joe Biden winning Wisconsin by 17 points in their last poll of the state. And so the idea that a highly rated pollster can never turn out a bad poll is just silly. So I like polling averages myself, but at the very least, I would go to 538 or Real Clear Politics, the two easiest to reach sites that list all of the polls in races. And you can look at their average, but also look at the range of polls around that average. And just don't commit yourself to believing that your favorite pollster that tells you the best news is absolutely right. Or your favorite pollster that's telling you bad news is absolutely right because you're one of those gloomy pessimists, okay? My party can never win. Um, but I do think the 538 list is one place you can go to try to get something based on the long-term accuracy pollsters have shown and what they've shown relative to other pollsters. And that's, that's I think, worth something. It's a real service that 538 provides. Um, now, I said the problem is those distributions are wider. They're more spread out than sampling error alone would expect. So sampling error is one source of polling error. And since all of Gaul is divided into two parts, non-sampling error is the other part. <laughs> those are the errors that come into polls that aren't because of the way you drew the sample, but are caused by other things, often practical problems rather than the sampling theory itself. Those are that we'll talk about non-response. Not everybody answers my phone calls. Now, I know that's not true of you because you're a high quality set of people. So thank you for continuing to answer every unknown call coming in just in case it's from me. If it's not from me, feel free to hang up on them, but you must answer every unknown call for me. Um, but non-response is a big issue. Measurement error. 
Not every time we ask a question do people understand what we're asking, or do they always respond in the way we expect them or want them to respond? Uh, campaign effects over time. Campaigns, if you believe anything, I think you should believe that campaigns matter. And that should lead you to conclude that knowing where the race stands in August is not where the race will end up at the end. And so as we go through a campaign, you should expect polls to change, not because the polls are unreliable, but because campaigns matter. Unless you want to believe that campaigns just don't matter at all, in which case you might as well predict the 2028 election today because campaigns don't matter. Um, and finally, turnout is uncertain, and that's another source of uncertainty in the polling. So let's look kind of quickly at some of these. Some kinds of non-response are relatively easy to, ma to manage, and I, I would stress relatively easy. Thanks to both the U.S. Census and the registered voter lists in the state, we have a real good idea of what in the whole population of Wisconsin the distribution of education really is. And so about, I definitely need new glasses or a bigger monitor. Um, about 27% of the state has a high school diploma only. That's the blue bars in this chart are the population numbers. In our raw sample without any adjustments, the beige or mustard colored bar, that's 22%. So we're about 5% light on high school only graduates. Go to the far right, because I'm not gonna read you every single number off this bar, and you see that people with more than a bachelor's degree love to do polls. And apparently love to pick up their phones, which is also interesting. So now, granted, this is not a huge share of the population. It's less than 15%. But in that post-BA, we get 25% in the sample versus basically half that 13% in the population. Now, what makes this relatively easy is, again, thanks to census, we know what the truth is. We know what those blue bars are. And so we can weight the sample, statistically adjust the size of these groups. So that's where the green bar comes in. Those are the percentages of each of these education groups in our weighted sample, which then is the basis for our estimates of the vote or of public opinion on various issues and so on. And you can see that after we've weighted to education and half a dozen other variables as well, we are virtually spot on the, the distribution for education for the population as a whole. And so it's very inconvenient that high school graduates are less likely to respond and postgraduates very likely to respond, but we know how to fix that, and we do. Let's look at the other one, age, which we were chatting about beforehand. And I personally would like to raise the voting age to about 35 because getting sub 30 year olds on the phone is really hard these days. It's always been fairly hard. The state voter registration data shows that about 15% of registered voters in the state are under 30. But we've routinely been getting between eight and 10% in our raw sample. But during this past fall, and these are the data from our very last poll before the election, we only got 5% that are under 30. Now, again, we fix that problem by weighting them up. And so in the weighted data, we're taking account of that. But the fact is, we were getting one third of that group responding compared to the half or a little better than half that we had had before. A lot of this has to do with changing behaviors and habits. Try getting your teenage daughter or son on the phone. Uh, if, you, if you get them, please let me know because my 20-something is still a challenge to reach. Um, and look off to the right. The geezers, my people as I call them, over 70, are much more likely to respond. So 
we again adjusted this because we know the, the right age distribution. Also notice these push in opposite directions. Older voters who are overrepresented in the sample are more pro-Trump. But highly educated voters are much less pro-Trump. So the fact that we're over-representing the older voters and, under, and over-representing the more educated voters in the raw sample kind of compensates for each other. There's no guarantee that that will happen, but that's what it, how it works out in practice. So how much does this matter? So speaking of Donald Trump, here's his favorability in our poll since uh, 2015 when we first started asking about him. And the yellow line is the unweighted sample, and the green line is the weighted sample. So you can see that these two move in parallel, more or less. The average difference between the weighted and the unweighted is 1.87 percentage points. So just under 2% more favorable to Trump when we weight the sample than when we take that unweighted sample. I think one of the myths out there is that weighting is really the secret sauce of surveys and you dramatically change your results if you wait to education or if you wait to something else. And that's just not true in my experience. It is very important to wait, don't get me wrong. We want to correct for that overrepresentation of older voters and that overrepresentation of more educated voters. That's important. This favorability to the most visible and controversial figure of our time by about 2% puts in perspective how much this matters. Now, if I'm doing an election and I want to get the best forecast I can, I sure want that extra 2% of getting closer to truth, right? So it's not trivial at all, but I, I take it from the media and reporters who theoretically should know better, who think that you can really turn a sample by 10 points, more points than that even, just if you wait by that person's favorite variable. That's just not true, just not true. But it is not huge. What about non-response of the hard kind? So this is favorability to Trump by partisanship. And again, the, the mustard-colored line at bar is the um, uh, unweighted, the green is weighted. Here you see that weighting within party doesn't make much difference at all. Those bars are awfully close to one another. And the very sharp difference across party is very, very clear. But what if some people favorable to Trump always decline to do the survey? That means every one of these three bars is too high. I'm sorry, is too low. And favorability should actually be a little bit higher because my non-respondents, even after I've adjusted for age and education and region of the state and even for party, some of those pro-Trump folks just still aren't doing the survey and that's specific to them, while pro-Biden people are not differentially agreeing to do the survey. That's what's so hard about this because if it's that kind of non-response, all of the waiting that I just took you through is not going to fix the problem because they're less responsive, even controlling for their age and education and partisanship. And there is no real good answer to this question. Industry generally is working awfully hard on. It's something that's been raised as a likely culprit in recent errors in 2016 and especially 2020. Um, but proving it is very hard because the very people you would need to talk to to prove it won't talk to you. And so this is where there's a huge dilemma. So how do we check for that in the Marquette poll? In every one of our surveys, we have a call record, a call log of every call we dial. Okay? In our last poll in the fall, we dialed about 180,000 numbers to get 800 completed interviews. 
Now, some of those are recalls because obviously we call back over the six or seven days of the field period. But it gives you a sense of just how hard it is to get someone to pick up. In the end, somewhere between 2 and 4% pick up the call. Again, repeated calls counted in that. And our final response rate is running between 1.5% and 2.5%. When I did my first national poll in 1988, we had a 75% response rate. That's the impact that telemarketing and now scam calls, not to mention caller ID, have played. And people, for those and other reasons, are simply less willing to pick up a call from an unknown number. It's a huge barrier. The one thing that saves political polling, public opinion polling, is Democrats and Republicans alike hate scam calls. And so there doesn't appear to be a partisan difference in non-response, even though nobody, practically, wants to pick up. So at one level, this is just a business problem. It requires us to pay a lot more money because we have to dial a lot more numbers to get the same number of completed interviews. But that alone doesn't lead to a bias in the surveys. So even with all those problems, as I told you, this past year, we had an average error and not a bad average error. Um, so what we do is we look at all those calls by county and we look at the response rate by county and plot it here against the vote for Trump in those counties in 2020. Because if this nightmare scenario I outlined for you that a certain type of pro-Trump voter is less willing to do the survey, then in counties with a whole lot of pro-Trump voters, we ought to get a lower response rate. And we ought to get a higher response rate where there are fewer Trump voters. So what I'm pleased, we do this on every single survey, but this again is the last one before the election. What you see from the, either the blue or the red line is that that's just a really flat pattern. There is no tendency for response rate to go up or down with more Trump voters in the county. The scatter gets pretty big off to the right in the heavily Trump counties, but some of those are responding at higher than average rates and others at lower than average rates. The overall, overall impact is no apparent bias. Now, the bad news is if I found there was a strong relationship here, I really don't know what to do about it because <laughs> it goes back to that non-response from people based on their views to the thing we really care about, opinion of Trump or maybe vote. So those are the issues, but this is how we look at it and how we examine it and why I can at least sometimes sleep before elections is because this is a reassuring chart despite those problems. Okay, measurement error. Let me move quickly through the last couple of these. Not everybody answers the way you want to. So the beige line here is the percent refusing to say how they would vote or how they voted in the election. If they had already voted, and the green bars are the refusals among those people who have not yet voted. And it's really quite stunning that people are willing to tell you how they would vote if the election were held today, the green bars. But if they say, yeah, I already sent in my ballot, and you then say, well, who did you vote for? Something close to 8 or 9% are unwilling to answer that question. And what happened in 2020? 40% voted early instead of less than 10% voted early. And so we got a big spike in refusals First of all, people did look like they were less willing to say how they'd vote, and that was true of both the early and the late voters. But we had so many more late or early voters in 2020. So this is a source of error in the vote measurement, and there's not much you can, well, there are things you can do about it, and we actually did that this year. Instead of asking if you've already voted before we ask the vote question, we ask if the election were held today, how would you vote? And then later we ask whether you've already voted or not. Guess what? The refusal rate fell back down to where it has been, though I'm still risking the fact that the early voters will report that question as a hypothetical question. 
as they actually did vote. But that's a source of uncertainty and measurement error. Um, campaigns vary over time. This is the Ohio Senate race last year. And you can see the Democrat was running ahead through most of the summer. But then J.D. Vance, the Republican, has a very strong surge that starts late summer, early fall, pulls comfortably into the lead. The polling averages showed about a seven-point Vance win, and in fact, he won by about seven points. So the poll was pretty good. But if you looked at a poll from September that showed the Democrat ahead, I don't think you want to say that poll was wrong. And one of the frustrations I see is that with early polling, an awful lot of people, even sophisticated reporters, will look at a poll that shows the conditions now, say here when the blue line is higher, and say, well, that can't be right because that's not the way the race is going to turn out. And as a pollster, I want to stress that that's not what we're saying. The poll is that snapshot of time of where the race stands today always knowing that the campaign will have its effects and shift over time. Um, but I do think there's an awfully, awfully strong tendency to say polls are all about predictions. And if you want me to predict the outcome of the Wisconsin race, I'll give you that today, 50-50. I won't be far off from that, right? But I expect the polls to fluctuate over time, reflecting the strengths of the candidates and the moments and events and so on. Um, turnout. Uh, the easy part would be knowing if you're in a presidential or a midterm election, because turnout is vastly different between those two. On the other hand, was 2022 turnout, you see the purple, bar, purple line and how our turnout in midterms has been rising unbelievably fast. So the easy thing would be to assume that 22 would have just been a linear projection of that trend. But in fact, what we saw was a modest but certainly noticeable downturn in turnout in 22. And so going into that election, should I have expected still further hot increases in turnout or should I have anticipated a little bit of a decline? Well, our polling suggested a little bit of a decline and I'm not going to take you through this one in the interest of time. The point here is we asked four times over the course of the fall how certain you were to vote. And the blue bars and the red bars over on the left of each of these figures is the percent turnout by Dems and reps. And sometimes the reps were a little bit above. Sometimes the Dems were a little bit above. And then right at the end, we had Democratic turnout at 89% and Republican at 83 that's of registered voters, not of all adults. And that turned out to be not terrible. A little bit of a Democratic advantage, but it only made itself apparent at the very end of the campaign. So the polls can help us understand whether turnout's going up or down this year. But the fact is, those fluctuations are hard to predict, and they can be consequential. Um, I'm going to skip that one. Um, so here's the trends in Wisconsin. We showed a pretty consistently tight governor's race with Evers leading in August, um, a tightening race in September, very tight at the beginning of October, just a one-point lead, and our final one did show a tied race. The third party candidate, the independent candidate, Becklinger, uh, was at four or five percent early and that trailed down a little bit in the end. We at the end had her at two points. She actually got one percent of the vote. So we saw this tight trend. If you looked at all of the polling in the state, not just ours, you saw an awfully similar pattern but with some variation around it. But I think all of the pollsters in relative agreement that this was a tight race a little bit of a difference in terms of who was going to be ahead right at the end. Um, if we look at the Senate race, it's a little more dynamic. In August, we had um, Barnes leading coming off the primary. And of course, we had an extraordinary primary with three of his major opponents dropping out, uh, a fairly uncontested or at least not a bitter primary period. Um, Senator Johnson, of course, had no opposition. But in the end, it meant that right after the primary, Barnes was ahead. 
That move, though, to a slight Johnson advantage in September and then a substantial Johnson advantage in October before it then tightened. And this is a good example of pollsters being a little white knuckled, right? We had seen Johnson doing better and better. And now here at the end, we see that race tightening. Do you believe that or not? The other way I can sleep at night is it's not my job to prognosticate. It's my job to tell you what the numbers showed, not whether I personally believe them or not. And so I happily walked out on the stage and said, okay, it's a tightening in this race, Johnson by two. So I was off by one, but Johnson by two. If you look at the other polls in the state, they didn't say that. Here they saw Johnson not only increasing the lead, but further increasing the lead at the end. So this is a case where us going against the polling average turned out to be more accurate than what the wisdom of the crowds of all the polls were. Um, you can debate about why that is. We already showed you that some of the polls were quite a bit too Republican in the state. Um, but the dynamic of the race is the interesting part that the initial attacks on Barnes seemed to really hurt him between August and September and seemed to get a little worse off after that. But then at the end, to come back to the very close race decided by 26,000 votes. Um, this is vote by partisanship. We are indeed an incredibly polarized state with 95 plus percent of Democrats voting for the Democratic candidate, Republicans for the Republican candidate. There's just very little movement over time. Independents had been a little more positive to Evers at the beginning of the race, then tightened in the middle, and at the end became just one point more pro-Evers than not. So those data all suggest a race, and that's why we said it was tied. We missed something there, that three-point actual margin is not visible here. So there's a mystery of what happened between our final poll and the election. On the Senate race, again, party loyalty is the same, extraordinarily high. But here, independents really did move from solidly pro-Barnes to substantially pro-Johnson at the end. I would chalk that up to campaign effects and it's sort of consistent movement over the course of the campaign. Um, Party loyalty was huge. Issues, inflation over there on the right was far and away the thing that people said was the most important issue, but it's not obvious that it really moved votes very much in state elections. And then you get um, well, public schools, then crime, then gun violence, accurate vote count, then abortion, kind of way down there, and then far to the left, COVID, which nobody seems to worry about anymore. What effects do these have? So, so many commercials focused on crime and especially the Milwaukee area. What you see is that being more afraid of crime slightly improved the Republican vote in the Senate. But what about your views of Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement? That had a much bigger effect. Those unfavorable to Black Lives Matter, much more voting for Republican within party whether it's Democrats uh, unfavorable or Republicans unfavorable, better for Johnson. And finally, the abortion decision in the Dobbs case that overturned Roe v. Wade, also substantial effects within party with those who supported that decision voting more Republican and less Democratic and vice versa. This is the final point. Knowing how partisans line up on an issue is really important. If you just look at views of abortion or any issue and don't take party into account, you're confounding that partisans think different things. So looking at it this way within party is the key to trying to understand which of these issues matter. And here of these three, crime didn't matter so much, but race, at least as captured by Black Lives Matter and Dobbs, uh, both mattered quite a bit. Um, there, we're done. We have time for one or two questions for Dr. Charles Franklin.
Thank you very much for your report. I don't know that I understand anything at all. Then I've not done my job today. Sorry about that. So do campaigns drive the polls or do the polls drive the campaigns? Within campaigns, polls are an integral part because if you're a campaign, you want to know whether your themes are playing well with voters. Cam uh, polls are a vital component of that. Now, there's certainly the image of the campaign that doesn't have a clue what they stand for and just wants to do a poll to then pair it back. And I don't dismiss that as, a, as an issue and, frankly, a problem. Um, so there's a difference between polling for the public, which is what I do, and polling for private interests, right? Um, if you're a campaign, you're going to do your polls and learn this stuff, but you're sure not going to share it with the public, right? let alone your opposition, any more than if you were doing market research for a business, you'd want to explain to your, your competitors uh, what the poll showed. So that's the real difference between these. Um, there's no question that campaigns care about this and maybe are responsive to it. The only good thing I can say is do we really want to encourage campaigns to further ignore what the public wants? At least if they're paying some attention to this, they're in some inadequate sense responsive. Yes? Uh, two, two related questions. Is there a standard way to ask uh, election polling questions in terms of whether you say, if the election were today, who would you vote for? Or do you ask, who do you expect to vote yeah. for in three weeks or two months yeah. or whatever? And I think a related question, has anyone studied, tried to study the, the extent to which, even if it's the same question, if you're mm -hmm. duplicating the question that you're going to answer in the poll, has anyone studied whether people answer that question differently in the context of a poll than when they actually cast a sure. vote? Sure. On the last one, the closest we can come is the polling errors chart that I showed you at the beginning, the difference between what the poll results said and what the actual outcome was. And you saw there's quite a spread there. Not bad on average, but with a good bit of spread. Another version is to ask people whether they voted in the election and then go check their voter registration file and see how that matches up. Not surprisingly, people tend to over-report their turnout, though it's a little challenging because the very people who agree to do polls are the more likely to be civically engaged and therefore actually are more likely to vote. So it's a little bit of a challenge. Questions are not absolutely standardized. We don't all go to one book and take exactly the same question wording. But I think on the big poll, big questions like vote, the if the election were held today has become a pretty standard version. Though, do you include a third party candidate or a fourth party, party candidate or not? There's a good deal of variation across polls on things like that. And then when we're asking about issues, how you word the issue, how you frame the issue can be vitally important. That's also where partisan polling can produce quite different results by how they frame the issue. Are you here to destroy Social Security, or are you here to save Social Security? One of those polls better than the other, even if you're talking about the same policy alternatives, right? And so there are really lots of room for that to matter. Yes? You mentioned that, um, thanks for being here, you mentioned that uh, phone responses are dwindling to almost 1 or 2 percent, right? Yes. Have you tried to poll by text? Yes, yes. And are those results similar? Yeah, in the summer of 2020, we did a full text to web, as it's called, send a text message with a link to a website to come and complete the survey. We did that full thing in July of 2020 while we were also doing a state phone poll. We were not impressed with the results of the text to web. Now, time has gone by, and a lot of campaign pollsters are using text to web as one part of their surveys. They tell me they reach younger voters that way, and they meet, reach more downscale voters that way. But the response rate is still down in that 1%, 2% range. It's just they're incredibly cheap to send. The trouble is there are regulatory issues about whether you can legally send such a text message. And that means the business side of this is pretty reluctant to fully embrace it. Uh, because there do seem to be some real business risks to doing that. Though some people have gotten past that. Uh, 
unless there's something else, we're done. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.